We're back. And, yeah, and you know, Stephen, uh, uh, another film Stephen should see that we've both seen, which sort of fits in with it, I think in a way is the Marion Stokes project. Just, um, it somehow seems to fit in, just being technical. That's but a very that one of the ones that's on the list from this year. Yeah. Do you know nope. anything about it? Nope. That's on my list now. I would love to hear Stephen's reactions to yeah. that. I, I think I some. I How think you. I think you'd be interested in it. It's on Canopy. It's on Canopy. Oh. Okay. So you can see it on Canopy, can't you, Stephen? Um. I I I joined the Berkeley Library one day, so I could see that it worked, and uh, and you, and I forgot all about it. Okay, I'm sure um, I can find it. But as Phil knows, as I've as I trudge through the uh, Pooh trilogy, it takes me a few years sometimes to sure. when I want to watch that. I might <laughs> see this particular one for a while, but uh, I'll get there. The action is it's about this woman who I don't know exactly when, sort of in the late seventies, when um, uh, Betamax and VHS and VCRs came along, she just became obsessed with taping everything and she concentrated especially when CNN came along so she had you know 24 hours a day she had three or four different VCRs set up and she just caught everything oh I think it was even more than three or four yeah it was seven, like something like that. seven or eight or something like when she like <clears throat> jumping ahead a little bit years after she died I think she find her family or son finally found someone to take all the material because and it, they show it entering into this warehouse somewhere in California, yeah. actually. She was from the East Coast, but it was tr it was trotted across the country. And yeah, it did a university, a university. I think so. Yeah, yeah. Or something. And it literally fills up a, like it's like, um, you know, truck after truckload of boxes of VHS like that. I was like, even though you're watching the movie and you're hearing all this stuff described, to see that visual at the end, I was astonished. I'm like, holy shit. Like, like no, no human being could ever actually watch that. No family could ever watch that <laughs> stuff. Like, and I think they went on a mission of actually um, cataloging it, like going through and, you know, letting people know where clips would be in that. So, so yeah. So well, yeah, I think that was the objective to get it all digitized so they could have an online library. But it was her life's work, you know, and at a certain point she rarely left the house. And um, it just, it's almost like a prediction of sort of the internet in a way. It seems connected somehow. Well, I was gonna say, Phil, you re you um, recommended the movie to me and I, I did love it. Like it might've been the best movie I saw last year. Yeah. Uh, but the one thing, it, but it was actually quite a surprise because just from your description and maybe even the little stuff I had read about it, I actually expected something quite a bit different. I thought it was going to be this um, sort of little quirky story about, you know, this person who hoarded things and maybe was a social outcast. And, and there's a little bit of that, but it, as it turns out, the woman herself led this very interesting life. She's a totally interesting person. She's an African-American woman. She marries this white, there's a bit of a racial yeah, uh, component about that. to the story. That. <laughs> um, she's an intellectual. She was in, she did this show. She was part of this TV show on public television where they would, and like, it was like in the late sixties where it was not that common to have a black woman on TV debating the issues of the day. Um, I just didn't expect any of that. And yet she's got this other life, but she did like, if you follow her story, she really does become like sort of, I don't, not a her hermit, but she became so cloistered in her life. And like, she was at a certain point, it kind of came a bit depressing because the only person she actually cared about was this, the love of her life, this man, but she kind of had cut off her family. She didn't like any of his kids. So his, her kid, his kids became estranged from her, her and her husband. It ends up on a, on a kinder note than that or a nicer note, but what an interesting person. And there's quite a bit in the movie that where it's not even the, the focus isn't even on the recording all this video footage and stuff. Really great, I forgot, great I, movie. Yeah, I've forgotten all that stuff until you mentioned it. I watched it very recently, so you know, it's yeah, more yeah. front of no, mind. So, got to catch up with that one. Um, the only other else? thing I'll say about that, really quickly, Phil, is uh, yeah. another thing. And I thought this was very good movie making. I really thought they chose 
the video clips they used really well and intelligently. And really, it was really exciting to see the way they played some of that stuff back. Like they played some of the stuff you'd expect, right? Like, um, you know, one of the space launches or whatever, yeah. Reagan assassination and stuff like that. But they re it was brilliantly edited. Like I just remember being, oh man, this like makes TV look so exciting. Like in the early eighties, like it was really good, so. No, you're right. I thought it had a great look to it. And it wasn't that sort of quirky woman. It, it just went far beyond that. And I thought it it did kind of reflect on technology. That's mm -hmm. one thing I, that it had that element to it. So what? Uh, let's see, new films. You guys, uh, why don't you guys talk about either Spike Lee or I'm really interested. I love the title, Never, Rarely, Sometimes, Always. I love the movie. Yeah, I loved it. I only I watched it less than a week ago. I saw it. I saw it on Steven's list, and I noticed it. I sent out that indie wire list, and I think it was the number two or three movie on that. Want to start on that, Stephen? Or you wrote a little review about it actually, which I liked. I think it was very short what you wrote about it, though. Uh, I always write short now. Um, <laughs> one of the things I thought when I was uh, looking back at the movies that we were going to talk about here. And I looked at what I'd written, and I, I realized I like so many of the time I say like with never rarely some of the the main actress had never acted before. She was a janitor. Uh, the other woman who was her best buddy, uh, she didn't even have a Wikipedia page. I think I said you know these, these were not they weren't amateurs maybe, but they they were just walking into this movie and they were great, you know which I I think. When the, when the whole movie has good directing, I'm sorry, good acting, I figured the director should get some of that credit because, you know, they were there to, to guide it. Anyway, the, the acting was terrific. The, it was, it was low-key. Um, like there's no spoiler in this sense. It's, it's about abortion, but it's not. Uh, abortion drives the plot. But it's about these two women. And uh, it's... Uh, effectively low budget but where you don't ever miss the fact that there's no budget um i don't know it's it's the kind of movie I, I don't know how you guys are but we talk a lot in this house about what movies i like compared to what movies my better half likes and uh she thinks i like movies where nothing happens <laughs> just <laughs> basically and she'll say, oh, that, you like that one. I can see why nothing happened. Well, something happens in this movie. But the plot isn't the important thing. It's a character study. It's very believable. I'm a sucker for uh, stories about teenage girls. And uh, so I was, I was primed to like it in the first place. And, and then it was really good. Steve, I, Satan Tango. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> nothing happens. I have a movie for you. <laughs> I, thought, I thought about that when it turned up on the... Criterion Channel, and and at our house, the movie that uh, we usually use as the example is I never remember the full name, but Jean Dielman, the three-hour movie where, she, as my wife thinks of it as the movie where she peels potatoes, because <laughs> I told her once I said, you know, you think that nothing's happening, and then one day she runs out of potatoes, and it's it's a <laughs> sunny or. or Michael just kissed Fredo and said, I know it was you. I mean, this is enormous. She when, she, when she drops the knife. I mean, oh, it's... man. <laughs> and, and then and the son says, you missed a button. She hadn't missed a button in, in two hours. <laughs> you missed a button. And she says, I ran out of potatoes. Like that. Was, <laughs> you know? Anyway. Yes. Yeah, same thing. Sorry. I got you. Uh, off. There. That's okay. That's that's worth is worth mentioning. Yes. I, I won't say. Was that a twenty twenty? <laughs> <laughs> no, it takes twenty hours yeah. and minutes to watch. But... So, so I, I want to say I, I I really like the point you're making there, Stephen, about never, rarely, sometimes, always, because I think although there is very definitely a plot, and I should also just throw in. I didn't know that was the plot when I went into it. I saw a description about it being like, I thought it was about two girls who traveled to New York and I didn't mm -hmm. see the other thing. And so when it's, when I'm watching the movie, I'm like, Oh, this is like, this is about this. 
But your point about nothing happening, although something very monumental, you know, in their lives does happen, and it is, you know, sometimes it's treated with that gravity. What is so great about the movie, I thought, one of the things that was so great about it is there are a lot of sequences where there's very little dialogue at all. Like, it's just yes, very, very sort of, it's got this very moody, and Phil goes for that stuff, I know, you haven't seen it, Phil, but it's got a very sort of moody um, thing happening throughout, and you just kind of, I found myself often trying to sort of figure out how the two girls in the movies were connecting with each other. Like sometimes they seemed like they're pissed off at each other. Sometimes they seem like they had this great bond and it was okay. Like there's a couple of scenes where they do have, or at least one scene where there's sort of a flare up and you think for a couple of seconds, oh, so the one girl's walking out and are they gonna like get split up here and get lost or something? But no, they get they come back together and it almost seems no, that's natural. Like they're they're close and you know, husband and a wife would go through that kind of thing, right? Where you'll just have some sort of blow up and you know you're not going anywhere kind of thing. So I really like that part of it. Um there's a couple great there's one great music sequence. I don't know if I do want to spoil that for Phil. I'll just say uh -huh. that it kind of reminds me a little it's bit a karaoke of karaoke scene. Well, yeah, and it reminds me of the Mr. Robot clip you sent out. It kind of reminds oh, me. Yeah, tell me what song. Tell me what song it is. Scott. Well, there's two, and one is done by this guy that they connect with, and he's very interesting character because you kind of don't know where that's going. Like, it's sort of on the edge of danger a little bit, but you don't know. But he does. They go to this bar, and he does a flock of seagulls song, wishing <laughs> I had a photograph of you. And it's actually really hot. Like, it reminds me of, uh, I keep bringing all these references, but it reminds me of Bill Murray in Lost in Translation. He sings it in this very low key rambling voice, but it actually sounds quite good. But then the main character comes on and does uh, Don't Let the Sun Catch You Crying. And it's actually quite just a, died. She's, got a, just... she's got an incredible voice. It's it's actually a beautiful version of the song. It's like I was completely floored by that. So is that Jerry and the Pacemakers or is it the Walker Brothers? I thought it was the Walker Brothers. I don't okay. know. Yeah. I have to look that up actually. I hear Jerry, I hear Jerry's voice. So I, Okay, maybe you're right. I don't know. Yeah. And he just died last week. That's why I asked That's Jerry right. and the Pacemakers. Oh, I gotta see that for sure now. Stephen, I want to ask you one thing. Though there's one, uh, this is just a quirky thing, but there's one sly little reference to Trump in that movie. I'm wondering if you caught, if you remember it, if you caught it. I either I didn't catch it or I don't remember it. Okay, maybe I shouldn't give it away. But Phil, that's one thing to look for in the movie. It's very okay. good. Although on the Trump point, this will be my last yeah. one. So I had a lot to say about this movie, but I thought the title of the movie itself is very is weirdly trumpian so it's called never rarely sometimes always and i was thinking i actually thought at first maybe it has something to do with this if you think of uh the trump every time trump and his team got into some scandal it always followed this same pattern of explanation it's like oh no we never we never met the russians well okay rare, rare, we had a rare meeting now and then well sure sometimes it happened it always happened fuck you like yeah. so i love that little progression right so but what it actually how it what it actually does mean in the movie is something a little it's more the, a little more harrowing maybe i'd say it's the, it's the, it's the, word, it's the key but. scene in the whole movie and yeah. for that reason i'd say unless you already know don't watch the trailer the trailer's fine but if you watch the trailer, you'll know why it's called what it is. And it, I think it's better not to know. And then you find out. And I didn't know. I didn't know. What a so perfect I, title. And, and uh, it's a it's a almost excruciating scene, but, but very much, yeah. I started a thread on the message board called Trump, you know, for Trump films early in his term, just thinking that there was good. And every, every you know, I always, I'm always cognizant of noticing stuff. And sometimes it's very slight. Sometimes, a lot of times, it's obvious what they put in. Sometimes it is very slight. I'm kind of loving right now the, you know, I'm a midway through the third season of Mr. Robot, and Trump's kind of in the background. It's weird because Obama's president. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, uh, by the way, Stephen, some of the lip sync or CGI stuff they do with Obama is amazing. Like, <laughs> wow, Obama really, he was, is this really, did this really happen? Wow. Um, yeah, and that yes. karaoke scene sounds great. That Mr. Robot karaoke scene I find so moving. Don't 
Don't let the sun catch you crying The night's the time for all your tears Your heart may be broken tonight But tomorrow in the morning light Don't let the sun catch you crying 